Part five of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part five. St. Louis hadn't been hit during the Holocaust. It still retained much of the old-fashioned flavor of the 19th and 20th centuries, especially in the residential districts. Bart Stanton liked to walk along those quiet streets of an evening just to let the peacefulness seep into him. And, knowing it was rather childish, he still enjoyed the small pleasure of playing hooky from the Neurophysics Institute. Technically, he supposed, he was still a patient there, more now that he had accepted Colonel Mannheim's assignment. He was presumably under military discipline. But he assumed that, if he had asked permission to leave the Institute's grounds, he would have been given that permission without question. But, like playing hooky or stealing watermelon, it was more fun if it was done on the sly. The boy who comes home feeling deliciously wicked and delightfully sinful after staying away from school all day can have his whole day ruined by being told that it was a holiday and that the school had been closed. Bart Stanton didn't want to spoil his fun by asking for permission to leave the grounds when it was so easy for a man, with his special abilities, to get out without asking. Besides, there was a chance, a small one, he thought, that permission might be refused for one reason or another, and Bart was fully aware that he could not disobey a direct request, to say nothing of a direct order, that he stay within the walls of the Institute. He didn't want to run any risk of losing his freedom, small though it was. After five years of mental and physical hell, he felt a need to get out into the world of normal, everyday people. His legs moved smoothly, surely, and unhurriedly, carrying him aimlessly along the resilient walkway, under the warm glow of the street lights. The people around him walked as casually and with seemingly as little purpose as he did. There was none of the brisk sense of urgency that he felt inside the walls of the Institute. He knew he could never get away from that sense of urgency completely, even out here. There were times when it seemed that all he had ever done, all his life, was to train himself for the single purpose of besting the knipe. If he wasn't training physically, he was listening to lectures from the psychologists, or from Colonel Mannheim, laying plans and considering possibilities for the one great goal that seemed to be the focal point of his whole life. What would happen if he failed? He would die, of course, and Mannheim's plan Beta would immediately go into effect. The knife would be killed eventually. But what if he stanton won then what the people around him were not part of his world really their thoughts their motions their reactions were slow and clumsy in comparison with his own once the knipe had been conquered what purpose would there be in the life of bartholomew stanton he was surrounded by people but he was not one of them he was immersed in a society that was not his own because it was not, could not be, geared to his abilities and potentials. But there was no other society to turn to, either. He was not a man alone afraid in a world he had never made. He was a man who had been made for a world, a society that did not exist. Women, a wife, a family life where with whom he pushed the thoughts from his mind the questions unanswered and perhaps unanswerable in spite of the apparent bleakness of the future he had no desire to die and there was the possibility that too much brooding of that kind would evoke a subconscious reaction that could slow him down or cause a wrong decision at a vital moment a feeling of futility could operate to bring on his death in spite of his conscious determination to win the coming battle with the knipe. The knipe was his first duty. When that job was finished, he could consider the problem of himself. Just because he could not now see the answer to that problem did not mean that no answer existed. 
He suddenly realized that he was hungry. He had been walking through Memorial Park, past the museum, an old, worn edifice that was still called the Missouri Pacific Building. There was a small restaurant only a block away. He reached into his pocket and took out the few coins that were there. Not much, but enough to buy a sandwich and a glass of milk. Because of the trust fund that had been set up when he had started the treatment at the Neurophysics Institute, he was already well off, but he didn't have much cash. What good was cash in the Institute where everything was provided? He stopped at a news vendor, dropped in a coin, and waited for the reproducing mechanism to turn out a fresh paper. Then he took the folded sheets and went on to the restaurant. He rarely read a news sheet. Mostly his information about the world that existed outside the walls of the Institute came from the televised newscasts. But occasionally he liked to read the small, relatively unimportant little stories about people who had done small, relatively unimportant things. Stories that didn't appear in the headlines or on the newscasts. The last important news story had come two nights before, when the Knipe had robbed an optical products company in Miami. The camera had shown the shop on the screen. Whatever had been used to blow open the door of the vault had been more effective than necessary. It had taken the whole front door of the shop and both windows, too. The bent and twisted paraglass that had lain on the pavement showed how much force had been applied from within. And yet, the results were not that of an explosion. It was more as though some tremendous force had pushed outward from within. It had not been the shattering shock of high explosive, but some great thrust that had unhurriedly yet irresistibly moved everything out of its way. Nothing had been moved very far, as it would have been by a blast. It appeared that everything had simply fallen aside, as though scattered by a giant hand. The main braces of the storefront were still there, bent outward a little, but not broken. The vault door had lain on the floor of the shop, only a few feet from the front door. The vault itself had been farther back, and the camera had showed it standing wide open, gaping. Inside had been pieces of fragile glass standing on the shelves, unmoved, unharmed. The force, whatever it had been, had moved in one direction only, from a point within the vault just a few feet from the door, pushing outward to tear out the heavy door as though it had been made of paraffin or modeling clay. Stanton had recognized the vault construction type, the Voisier construction, which, by test, could withstand almost everything known outside of the actual application of atomic energy itself. In a widely publicized demonstration several years before, a Voisier vault had been cut open by a team of well-trained, well-equipped technicians. It had taken 21 hours for them to breach the wall, and they had no fear of interruption or of making a noise or of setting off the intricate alarms that were built into the safe itself. Not even a Borazon drill could make such an impression on a metal which had been formed under millions of atmospheres of pressure. And yet, the knipe had taken that door out in a second, without much effort at all. The crowd that had gathered at the scene of the crime had not been large. The very thought of the knipe kept people away from places where he was known to have been. The specter of the knipe evoked a fear, a primitive fear, fear of the dark and fear of the unknown, combined with the rational fear of a very real, very tangible danger. And yet there had been a crowd of onlookers. In spite of their fear, it is hard to keep human beings from being curious. It was known that the knipe didn't stay around after he had struck, and besides the area was now full of armed men. So the curious came to look and to stare in revulsion at the neat pile of gnawed and bloody bones that had been the night watchman, carefully killed and eaten by the night before he had opened the vault. Thus curiosity does make fools of us all, and the native hue of caution is crimsoned o'er by the bright red of morbid fascination. 
Stanton went through the door of the automat restaurant and walked over to the vending wall. The dining room was only about three quarters full of people. There were plenty of seats available. He fed coins into the proper slots, took his sandwich and milk over to a seat in one corner, and made himself comfortable. He flipped open the newspaper and looked at the front page, and for a moment his brain seemed to freeze. The story itself was straightforward enough. Ben Kaim kidnappers nabbed. Stan Martin does it again. Series, June 3rd, Interplanetary News Service. The three men and three women who allegedly kidnapped ten-year-old Shmuel Ben Kaim were brought to justice today through the single-handed efforts of Stanley Martin, famed investigator for Lloyds of London. The boy, held prisoner for more than ten months on a small asteroid, was reported in very good health. According to Lieutenant John Vale of the Planetoid Police, the kidnap gang could not have been taken by direct assault on their hideout because of fear that the boy might be killed. The operation required a carefully planned one-man infiltration of their hideout, he said. Mr. Martin was the man for the job. Labeled the most outrageous kidnapping in history, the affair was conceived as a long-term method of gaining control of Heavy Metals Incorporated, controlled by Moish ben Kayim, the boy's father. The details... But Bart Stanton wasn't interested in the details. After only a glance through the first part of the article, his eyes returned to the picture alongside the article. The line of print beneath it identified the man in the picture as Stanley Martin. But a voice in Bart Stanton's brain said, Not Stan Martin. The name is Mart Stanton. And Bartholomew felt a roar of confusion in his mind, because he didn't know who Mart Stanton was, and because the face in the picture was his own. He was walking again. He didn't quite remember how he had left the automat, and he didn't even try to remember. He was trying to remember other things, farther back, before he had... Before he had what? Before the Institute? Before the beginning of the operations? The memories were there, just beyond the grasp of his conscious mind, like the memories of a dream after one has awakened. Each time he tried to reach into the darkness to grasp one of the pieces, it would break up into smaller bits. The patterns were too fragile to withstand the direct probing of his conscious mind. Only the resulting fragments held together long enough to be analyzed. And, while part of his mind probed frantically after the elusive particles of memory, another part of it watched the process with semi-detached amusement. He had always known there were holes in his memory. Always? Don't be silly, pal but it was disconcerting to find an area that was as riddled as a used machine-gun target. The whole fabric had been punched to bits. No man's memory is completely available at any time. However it is recorded, however completely every bit of data may be recorded during a lifetime, much of it is unavailable because it is incompletely cross-indexed, or in some cases labeled Do Not Scan, or, metaphorically, the file drawer may be locked. It may be that, in many cases, if a given bit of data remains unscanned long enough, it fades into illegibility, never reinforced by the scanning process. Sensory data, coming in from the outside world as it does, is probably permanent. But the thought patterns originating within the mind itself... The processes that correlate and cross-index and speculate on and hypothesize about the sensory data, those are much more fragile. A man might glance once through a Latin primer and have every page imprinted indelibly on his recording mechanism and still be unable to make sense of the natura incubito cum puella est. Sometimes a man is aware of the holes in his memory. What was the name of that fellow I met at Eddie's party? Can't remember it for the life of me. At other times a memory may lay dormant and unremembered, leaving no apparent gap, until a tag of some kind brings it up. 
that girl with the long hair reminds me of susie bluegerhugel my gosh i haven't thought of her in years both factors seem to be operating in bart stanton's mind at this time incredibly he had never in the past year at least had occasion to try to remember much about his past life he had known who he was without thinking about it particularly and the rest of his knowledge language history politics geography and so forth had been readily available for the most part ask any educated man to give the product of the primes two thirteen and forty one or ask him to give the date of the norman conquest and he can give the answer without having to think of where he learned it or who taught it to him or when he got the information but now the picture and the name in the paper had brought forth a reaction in stanton's mind and he was trying desperately to bring the information out of oblivion did he have a mother surely but could he remember her yes certainly a pretty gentle rather sad woman he could remember when she had died although he couldn't remember ever having attended the funeral what about his father he could find no memory of his father and at first that bothered him he could remember his mother could almost see her moving around in the apartment where they had lived in 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 denver sure and he could remember the building itself and the block and even mrs forbisher who lived upstairs and the school a great many memories came crowding back but there was no trace of his father and yet oh of course his father had been killed in an accident when martin bart were very young martin bart the name flitted through his mind like a scrap of paper in a high wind but he reached out and grasped it martin bart martin bart mart in bart mart and bart the stanton twins it was curious he thought that he should have forgotten his brother and even more curious that the name in the paper had not brought him instantly to mind martin the cripple martin the boy with the radiation shattered nervous system the boy who had had to stay in a therapy chair all his life because his efferent nerves could not control his body the boy who couldn't speak or rather wouldn't speak because he was ashamed of the gibberish that resulted martin the non-entity the nothing the nobody the one who watched and listened and thought but could do nothing bart stanton stopped suddenly and unfolded the newspaper again under the glow of the street lamp his memory certainly didn't jive with this his eyes ran down the column of type mr martin has in the eighteen months since he came to the belt run up an enviable record both as an insurance investigator and as a police detective although his connection with the planetoid police is necessarily an unofficial one probably not since sherlock holmes has there been such mutual respect and cooperation between the official police and a private investigator there was only one explanation stanton thought martin too had been treated by the institute his memory was still blurry and incomplete but he did suddenly remember that a decision had been made for martin to take the treatment he chuckled a little at the irony of it they hadn't been able to make a superman of martin but they had been able to make a normal and extraordinarily capable man of him now it was bart who was the freak the odd one turn about is fair play he thought but somehow it didn't seem quite fair he crumpled the newspaper dropped it into a nearby waste chute and walked on through the night toward the neurophysical institute interlude you understand mr stanton said the psychiatrist that a great part of martin's trouble is mental as much as physical because of the nature of his ailment he has withdrawn pulled himself away from communication with others 
if these symptoms had been brought to my attention earlier the mental disturbance might have been more easily analyzed and treated i'm sorry doctor said mrs stanton her manner betrayed weariness and pain it was so so difficult martin could never talk very well you know and he just talked less and less as the years went by it was so gradual that i never really noticed it poor woman the doctor thought she's not well herself she should have married again rather than carry the whole burden alone her role as a doting mother hasn't helped either of the boys to overcome the handicaps that were already present i've tried to do my best for martin mr stanton went on unhappily and so has bart when they were younger bart used to take him out all the time they went everywhere together of course i don't expect bart to do that so much any more he has his own life to live he can't take martin out on dates or things like that but when he's home bart helps me with martin all the time i understand said the doctor this is no time to tell her that bartholomew's tests indicate that he has subconsciously resented martin's presence for a long time she has enough to worry about i don't understand said mr stanton breaking into sudden tears i don't understand why martin should behave this way why should he just sit there with his eyes closed and ignore us both the doctor comforted her in a warmly professional manner then as her tears subsided he said we don't understand all of the factors ourselves mr stanton martin's reactions are i admit unusual his behavior doesn't quite follow the pattern that we usually expect from such cases as this his physical disability has drastically modified the course of his mental development and at the same time makes it difficult for us to make any analysis of his mental state is there anything you can do doctor we don't know yet he said gently he considered for a moment then said mr stanton i'd like for you to leave both boys here for a few days so that we can perform further tests that will help us a great deal in getting at the root of martin's problem she looked at him with a little surprise why yes of course but why should bart stay the doctor weighed his words carefully before he spoke bart is our control mr stanton since the boys are genetically identical they should have been a great deal alike in personality if it hadn't been for martin's accident in other words our tests of bart will tell us what martin should be like that way we can tell just how much and in what way martin deviates from what he should ideally be do you understand yes yes i see all right doctor whatever you say after mr stanton had left the psychiatrist sat quietly in his chair and stared thoughtfully at the desk top for several minutes then making his decision he picked up a small book that lay on his desk and looked up a number in arlington virginia he punched out the number on his phone and when the face appeared on the screen he said hello sydney look i have a very interesting case out here that i'd like to talk to you about do you happen to have a telepath who's strong enough to take a meshing with an insane mind if my suspicions are correct i'll need a man with an impregnable sense of identity because he's going to get into the weirdest situation i've ever come across end of part five Part six of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part six. Puck, puck, ping. Puck, puck, ping. Puck, puck, ping. The action in the handball court was beautiful to watch. The robot mechanism behind Bart Stanton would fire out a ball at random intervals, ranging from a tenth to a quarter of a second, bouncing them off the wall in random patterns. Stanton would retrieve the ball before it hit the ground, bounce it off the wall again to strike the target on the moving robot. Stanton had to work against a machine. 
no ordinary human being could have given him any competition pock pock ping pock pock ping pock pock plunk one miss stanton said to himself but he fielded the next one nicely and slammed it home pock pock ping the physical therapist who was standing by glanced at his watch it was almost time pock pock ping the machine having delivered its last ball shut itself off with a smug click stanton turned away from the handball court and walked toward the physical therapist who held out a robe for him that was good bart he said real good one miss stanton said as he shrugged into the robe yeah your timing was a shade off there i guess but you ran a full minute over your previous record stanton looked at him you reset the timer again he said accusingly but there was a grin on his face the pt man grinned back yep come on step into the mummy case he waved toward the narrow niche in the wall of the court a niche just big enough to hold a standing man stanton stepped in and various instrument pickups came out of the walls and touched his body hidden machines recorded his heartbeat blood pressure brain activity muscular tension and several other factors after a minute the pt man said okay bart let's hit the steam box stanton stepped out of the niche and accompanied the therapist to another room where he took off the robe again and sat down on the small stool inside an ordinary steam box the box closed leaving his head free and the box began to fill with steam did i ever tell you what i don't like about that machine bart asked as the therapist draped a heavy towel around his head nope didn't know you had any gripe what is it you can't gloat after you beat it you can't walk over and pat it on the shoulder and say well better luck next time old man it isn't a good loser and it isn't a bad loser the damn thing doesn't even know it lost and if it did it wouldn't care <laughs> i see what you mean said the pt man chuckling you beat the pants off it and what do you get not even a case of the sulks out of it exactly and what's worse i know perfectly good and well that it's only half trying the damn thing could beat me easily if you just turn that knob over a little more you're not competing against the machine anyway the therapist said you're competing against yourself trying to beat your own record i know and what happens when i can't do that any more either stanton asked i can't just go on getting better and better forever i've got limits you know sure said the therapist easily so does a golf player but every golfer goes out and practices by himself to try to beat his own record bunk the real fun in any game is beating someone else the big kick in golf is in winning over the other guy in a twosome how about crossword puzzles or solitaire solve a crossword puzzle and you've beaten the guy who made it up in solitaire you're playing against the laws of chance and even that can become pretty boring what i'd like to do is to get out on the golf course with someone else and do my best and then lose honestly with a handicap the therapist began then he grinned weakly and stopped on the golf course stanton was impossibly good one long drive to the green one putt to the cup an easy thirty-six strokes for eighteen holes an occasional hole in one sometimes brought him below that an occasional worm cast or stray wind sometimes raised his score sure stanton said a handicap what kind of handicap do you want on a handball game with me the pt man could imagine himself trying to get under one of stanton's lightning-like returns the thought of what would happen to his hand if he were to accidentally catch one made him wince we wouldn't even be playing the same game stanton said the therapist stepped back and looked at stanton you know he said puzzledly you sound bitter 
Sure, I'm bitter, Stanton said. All I get is exercise. All the fun has gone out of it. He sighed and grinned. There was no point in worrying the PT man. I'll just have to stick to cards and chess if I want competition. Speed and strength don't help anything if I'm holding two pair against three of a kind. Before the therapist could say anything, the door opened, and a tall, lean man stepped into the fog-filled room. "'You are broiling a lobster?' he asked the P.T. blandly. "'Steaming a clam,' came the correction. "'When he's done, I'll pound him to chowder.' "'Excellent. I came for a clam bake,' the tall man said. "'You're early then, George,' Stanton said. He didn't feel in the mood for light humor and the appearance of Dr. Yuritomo did nothing to improve his humor. George Yuritomo beamed, crinkling up his heavy-lidded eyes. Ah, a talking clam. Excellent. How much longer does he have to cook? Twenty-three minutes. Why? Would you be so good as to return at the end of that time? The therapist opened his mouth, closed it, opened it again, and said, uh, Sure, Doc, I can get some other stuff done. I'll see you then. I'll be back, Bart. He went out through the far door. After the door closed, Dr. Yuritomo pulled up a chair and sat down. New developments, he said, as you may have surmised. I guessed, Stanton said. What is it? He flexed his muscles under the caress of the hot, moist currents in the box. He wondered why it was so important that the psychologist interrupt him while he was relaxing after strenuous exercise. Yuritomo looked excited in spite of his calm. And yet Stanton knew that there couldn't be anything urgent, or Yuritomo would have acted differently. It was relatively unimportant now, anyway, Stanton thought. Having made his decision to act on his own had changed his reaction to the decisions of others. Yuritomo leaned forward in his chair, his thin lips in an excited smile, his black irised eyes sparkling. I had to come tell you. The sheer, utter beauty of it is too much to contain. Three times in a row was almost absolute, Bart. The probability that our hypothesis is correct was computed as straight nines to seven decimals. But now... The fourth time, straight nines to twelve decimals. Scanton lifted an eyebrow. Your oriental calm is deserting you, George. I'm not reading you. Your Tomo's smile became broader. Ah, sorry, I refer to the theory we have been discussing about the memory of the nipe, you know? Stanton knew. Dr. Yuritomo was, in effect, one of his training instructors. Advanced alien psychology, Stanton thought. Seminar course, the mental whys and wherefores of the nipe, or how to outthink the enemy in twelve easy lessons. Instructor, Dr. George Yuritomo. After six years of watching the recorded actions of the nipe, Yoritomo had evolved a theory about the kind of mentality that lay behind the four baleful violet eyes in that alien head. Now he evidently had proof of that theory. He was smiling and rubbing his long, bony hands together. For George Yoritomo, that was the equivalent of hysterical excitement. We have been able to predict the behavior of the nipe, he said, for the fourth time in succession. Great, but how does that fit in with that rule you once told me about? You know, the one about experimental animals. Ah, yes, the Harvard Law. A genetically standardized strain under precisely controlled laboratory conditions when subjected to carefully calibrated stimuli will behave as it damned well pleases. Yes, very true. But an animal could not do otherwise, could it? Only as it pleases. And it could not please to behave as something it is not, could it? Draw me a picture, Stanton said. I mean that any organism is limited in its choice of behavior. 
A hamster, for instance, cannot choose to behave in the manner of a rhesus monkey. A dog cannot choose to react as a mouse would. If I prick a rat with a needle, it may squeal or bite or jump, but it will not bark. Never. Nor will it leap up to a trapeze, hang by its tail, and chatter curses at me. Never. By observing an organism's reactions, one can begin to see a pattern. If you tell me that you put an armful of hay into a certain animal's enclosure, and that animal trotted over, ate the hay, and brayed, I can tell you with reasonable certainty that the animal has long ears. Do you see? You haven't been able to pinpoint the knife that easily, have you? Stanton asked. Ah, uh, no. Uh, the more intelligent a creature is, the greater its scope of action. The knife is far from being so simple as a monkey or a hamster. On the other hand, he smiled widely, showing bright white teeth, he is not so bright as a human being. What? I wouldn't say he was exactly stupid, George. What about all those prize gadgets of his? He blinked. Wipe the sweat off my forehead, will you? It's running into my eyes. Dr. Yoritomo wiped with the towel as he continued. Ah, yes, he is quite capable in that respect, my friend. It is his great memory, at once his finest asset and his greatest curse. He draped the towel around Stanton's head again and stepped back, his face unsmiling. Imagine having a near-perfect memory. Stanton's jaw muscles tightened. I think I'd like it. Yoritomo shrugged slightly. Perhaps you would, but it would not be the asset you think. Look at it soberly, my friend. The most difficult teaching job in the universe is the attempt to teach an organism something it already knows. True? Yes. If a man already knows the shape of the earth, it will do you no good to attempt to teach him. If he knows that the earth is flat, your contention that it is round will make no impression whatever. He knows, you see. He knows. Now, imagine a race with a perfect memory, one which does not fade, a memory in which each bit of data is as bright and fresh as the moment it was imprinted, and as readily available as the data stored in a robot's mind. It is, in effect, a robotic memory. If you put false data into the memory bank of a computer, such as telling it that the square of two is five, you cannot correct the error simply by telling it that the square of two is four. You must first remove the erroneous data, not so? Very good. Then let us look at the Nipe race, wherever it was spawned in the universe. Let us look at their race a long time back, when they first became Nipe sapiens. Back when they first developed a true language. Each child, as it is born or hatched or budded, whatever it is they do, is taught as rapidly as possible, all the things it must know to survive. And once it is taught a thing, it knows. And if it is taught a falsehood, then it cannot be taught the truth. Wouldn't cold reality force a change? Stanton asked. Ah, in some cases, yes. In most, no. Look. Suppose a primordial nipe runs across a tiger, or whatever passes for a tiger on their planet. He has never seen a tiger before. So he does not see that this particular tiger is old, ill, and weak. He hits it on the head, and it drops dead. He takes it home for the family to feed on. How did you kill it, Papa? I walked up to it, bashed it on the noggin, and it died. That is the way to kill tigers. Yoritomo smiled. It is also a good way to kill nipes, eh? He took the towel and wiped Stanton's brow again. The error, he continued, was made when Papa Nipe generalized from one tiger to all tigers. If tigers were rare, 
this bit of lore might be passed on for many generations those who learned that most tigers are not conquered by walking up to them and hitting them on the noggin undoubtedly died before they could pass this bit of information on then one day a nipe survived the ordeal his mind now contained conflicting information which must be resolved he knows that tigers are killed in this way he also knows that this one did not die plainly then this one is not a tiger ha he has the solution what does he tell his children why first he tells them how tigers are killed then he warns them that there is an animal that looks just like a tiger but is not a tiger one should not make the mistake of thinking it is a tiger or one will get badly hurt since the only way to tell the true tiger from the false tiger is to hit it and since that test may prove fatal to the knife who tries it it follows that one is better off if one avoids all animals that look like tigers you see yeah said stanton some snarks are boojums exactly thank you for that allusion i must remember to use it in my report it seems to me to follow stanton said musingly that there would be some things that they'd never learned the truth about once they'd gotten a wrong idea in their heads ah indeed it is precisely that which led me to formulate my theory in the first place how else to explain the fact that the nipe for all his technical knowledge is still in the ancient ritual taboo stage of development a savage yoritomo smiled as to his savagery i think no one on earth would disagree but they are not the same thing what i do mean is that the nipe is undoubtedly the most superstitious and bigoted being on the face of this planet there was a knock at the door and the physical therapist put his head in sorry to interrupt but the clam is done i'll give him a rub down doc and you can have him back excellent would you come up to my office bart as soon as you've had your mauling sure i'll be right up yoritomo left and the p t man opened the steam box feel okay bart yeah sure he said abstractedly as he got up on the rub down table and lay prone the therapist saw that stanton was in no mood for conversation so he proceeded with the massage in silence for the first time stanton was seeing the nipe as an individual as a person as a thinking feeling being we have a great deal in common you and i he thought except that you're a lot worse off than i am i'm actually feeling sorry for the poor guy stanton thought which i suppose is better than feeling sorry for myself the only difference between us freaks is that you're a bigger freak than i am molly o'grady and the colonel's lady are sisters under the skin where'd that come from something i learned in school i guess like the snarks and boojums he would answer to high or to any loud cry such as fry me or fritter my wig who was that the snark no damn this memory of mine or can i even call it mine when i can't even use it for now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face now i know in part but then shall i know even as also i am known another jack-in-the-box thought popping up from nowhere the only way i'll ever get all this stuff straightened out is to get more information and it doesn't look as though anyone is going to give it to me on a platter the institute seems to be awfully chary about giving information away george even had to chase away old rub and pound here that feels good before he would talk about the nipe can't blame him for that i guess they'd be hell to pay if the public ever found out that the nipe has been kept as a pet for six years how many people has he killed in that time twenty thirty how much blood does colonel mannheim have on his hands 
though they know not why or what they give still the few must die that the many may live i wonder whether i read all that stuff complete or just browsed through a copy of bartlett's quotations fragments we've got to get organized here brother colonel manheim's little puppet is going to cut his strings and do a pinocchio okay bart the pt said giving stanton a final slap you're all set see you tomorrow right give me my clothes stanton dressed and took the elevator up to yoritomo's office this section of the building was off limits to the other patients in the institute but stanton the star boarder had free reign not that it mattered one way or another there wasn't any way they could have stopped him aside from the fact that he was physically capable of going through or around almost any guards they wanted to put up there was also the little matter of gentle blackmail when a man is genuinely indispensable he can work wonders by threatening to drop the whole business he felt as though he had been slowly awakened from a long sleep at first he had accepted as natural that he should obey orders and do as he was told without question as though he had been drugged or hypnotized and it's very likely they subjected me to both at one time or another he told himself but now his brain was beginning to function again and the need to know was strong in his mind dr yoritomo was sitting in one of the big soft chairs puffing at a pipe but he leaped to his feet when stanton came in ah about the ritual taboo culture of the nipe yes sit down yes so do you find it impossible that a high technology could be present in such a system no i've been thinking about it ah so he sat down again then you will please tell me well let's see in the first place let's take religion in tribal cultures religion is ah uh, animistic i think the word is yoritomo nodded silently there are spirits everywhere scanton went on that sort of belief it seems to me would grow up in any race that had imagination and the nipes must have plenty of that or they wouldn't have the technology they do have very good very good but what evidence have you that this technology was not given them by some other race i hadn't thought of that stanton stared into space for a moment then nodded his head of course it would take too long for another race to teach it to them it wouldn't be worth the trouble unless this hypothetical other race killed off all the adult nipes and started the little ones off fresh and if that happened their ritual taboo system would have disappeared too that argument is imperfect yoritomo said but it will do for the moment go on with the religion okay religious beliefs are not subject to pragmatic tests that is the spiritual beliefs aren't any belief that could be disproven would eventually die out but beliefs in ghosts or demons or angels or life after death aren't disprovable so as a race increases its knowledge of the physical world its religion tends to become more and more spiritual agreed yes but how do you link this with ritual taboo well once a belief gains a foothold it's hard to wipe out even among humans among nipes it would be well nigh impossible once a code of ritual and social behavior was set up it becomes permanent for example yoritomo urged well shaking hands for example we still do that even if we don't have it fixed solidly in our heads that we must do it i suppose it would never occur to a nipe not to perform such a ritual just so yoritomo agreed vigorously such things once established would tend to remain but it is a characteristic of a ritual taboo system that it resists change how then do you account for their high technological achievements the pragmatic engineering approach i imagine 
if a thing works it is usable if not it isn't very good now it is my turn to lecture he put his pipe in an ashtray and held up a long bony finger firstly we must remember that the knife is equipped with an imagination secondly he has in his memory a tremendous amount of data already at hand he is capable of working out theories in his head you see like the ancient greeks he finds no need to test such theories unless his thinking indicates that such an experiment would yield something useful unlike the greeks he has no aversion to experiment but he sees no need for useless experiment either oh he would learn yes but once a given theory proved workable how resistant he would be to a new theory how long uh, how incredibly long it would take such a race to achieve the technology the knife now has hundreds of thousands of years said stanton yoritomo shook his head briskly Puh, longer much longer he smiled with satisfaction i estimate that the knife race first invented the steam engine not less than ten million years ago he kept on smiling into the dead silence that followed after a long minute scanton said what about atomic energy oh at least two million years ago i do not think they have had the interstellar drive more than fifty thousand years no wonder our pet knife is so patient stanton said wonderingly i wonder what their individual lifespan is not long in comparison said yoritomo perhaps no longer than our own perhaps five hundred years considering their handicaps they have done quite well quite well indeed for a race of illiterate cannibals how's that again stanton realized that the scientist was quite serious hadn't it occurred to you my friend that they must be cannibals and that they are very nearly illiterate no stanton admitted it hadn't the knife like man is omnivorous specialization tends to lead any race up a blind alley and dietary restrictions are a particularly pernicious form of specialization a lion would starve to death in a wheat field a horse would perish in a butcher shop full of steaks a man will survive as long as there's something around to eat even if it's another man also man early in his career as top dog on earth began using a method of increasing the viability of the race by removing the unfit it survives today in some societies before and immediately after the holocaust there were still primitive societies on earth which made a rather hard ordeal out of the rite of passage the ceremony that enabled a boy to become a man if he passed the tests a few millennia ago a boy was killed outright if he failed and eaten end of part six Part seven of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part seven. The Knipe race must, of necessity, have had some similar ritualistic tests, or they would not have become what they are. And we have already agreed that once the Knipes adopted something of that kind, it remained with them. Not so? Yes also it is extremely unlikely that the knipe civilization if such it can be called has any geriatric problem no old age pensions no old folks homes no senility when a knipe becomes a burden because of age he is ritually murdered and eaten with due solemnity ah you frown my friend have i made them sound heartless without the finer feelings that we humans are so proud of not so when junior knipe fails his puberty tests when mama and papa knipe are sent to their final reward i have no doubt that there is sadness in the hearts of their loved ones as the honored t-bones are passed around the table 
my own ancestors not too far back performed a ritual suicide by disemboweling themselves with a sharp knife across the abdomen so and up into the heart so it was considered very bad form to die or faint before the job was done nearby a relative or close friend stood with a sharp sword to administer the coup de grace by decapitation it was all very sad and very honorable their loved ones bore the sorrow with pride his voice which had been low and tender suddenly became very brisk thank goodness it's gone out of fashion but how can you be sure they're cannibals stanton asked your argument sounds logical enough but logic alone isn't enough true true yoritomo jabbed the air twice with his finger evidence would be most welcome would it not very well i give you the evidence he eats human beings our nipe that doesn't make him a cannibal not strictly perhaps but consider the nipe is not a monster he is not a criminal no he is a gentleman he behaves as a gentleman he is shipwrecked on an alien planet around him he sees evidence that ours is a technological society but that is a contradiction a paradox for we are not civilized no we are not rational we are not sane we do not obey the laws we do not perform the rituals we are animals apparently intelligent animals but animals nevertheless how can this be ha says the knight to himself these animals must be ruled over by real people it is the only explanation not so colonel mannheim mentioned that are you implying that the knight thinks that there are other knights around running the world from secret hideouts like the fu manchu novel not quite the knight is not incapable of learning something new in fact he is quite good at it as witness the fact that he has learned many earth languages he picked up russian in less than eight months simply by listening and observing like our own race his undoubtedly evolved many languages during the beginnings of his progress when there were many tribes separated and out of communication it would not surprise me to find that most of those languages have survived and that our distressed astronaut knows them all a new language would not distress him nor would strangely shaped intelligent beings distress him his race should be aware by now that such things exist but it is very likely that he equates true intelligence with technology and i do not think he has ever met a race higher than the barbarian level before such races were not of course human by his definition they showed possibilities perhaps but they had not evolved far enough considering the time span involved it is not at all unlikely that the knight thinks of technology as something that evolves with the race in the same way intelligence does or the body itself so it would not surprise him to find that the real people of this system were humanoid in shape that is something new and he can absorb it it does not contradict anything he knows but any truly intelligent being which did not obey the law and follow the ritual would be a contradiction in terms for he has no notion of a real person without those characteristics without those characteristics technology is impossible since he sees technology all around him it follows that there must be real people with those characteristics anything else is unthinkable it seems to me that you're building an awfully involved theory out of pretty flimsy stuff stanton said yoritomo shook his head not at all all evidence points to it why do you suppose does the knight conscientiously devour his victims often risking his own safety to do so 
why do you suppose he never uses any weapons but his own hands to kill with why to tell the real people that he is a gentleman made perfect sense stanton thought it fitted every known fact as far as he knew still i would think he said that the knife would have realized after ten years that there is no such race of real people he's had access to all our records and such things or does he reject them as lies possibly he would if he could read them did i not say he was illiterate you mean he's learned to speak our languages but not to read them the scientist smiled broadly your statement is accurate my friend but incomplete it is my opinion that the knife is incapable of reading any written language whatever the concept does not exist in his mind except vaguely a technological race without a written language that's impossible ah no ask yourself what need has a race with a perfect memory for written records at least in the sense we know them certainly not to remember things all their history and all their technology exists in the collective mind of the race or at least most of it i dare say that the less important parts of their history has been glossed over and forgotten one important event in every ten centuries would still give a historian ten thousand events to remember and history is only a late development in our own society how about communications stanton said what did they use before they invented radio ah that is why i hedged when i said he was almost illiterate there is a possibility that a written symbology did at one time exist for just that purpose if so it has probably survived as a ritualistic form when an officer is appointed to a post let's say he may get a formal paper that says so they may use symbols to signify rank and so on they certainly must have a symbology for the calibration of scientific instruments but none of these requires the complexity of a written language i dare say our use of it is quite baffling to him and if he thinks of symbols as being unable to convey much information then he might not be able to learn to read at all you see where's your evidence for that it is sketchy i will admit said yoritomo it is not as solidly based as our other reconstructions of his background the pattern of his raids indicates however that his knowledge of the materials he wants and their locations comes from vocal sources television advertising eavesdropping and so on in other words he cases the joint by ear if he could understand written information his job would have been much easier he would have found the materials more quickly and easily from this evidence we are fairly certain that he can't read any terrestrial writing add to that the fact that he has never been observed writing down anything himself and the suspicion dawns that perhaps he knows that symbols can only convey a very small amount of specialized information eh as i said it is not proof no but the whole thing makes for some very interesting speculation doesn't it very interesting indeed yoritomo folded his hands in his lap smiled seraphically and looked at the ceiling in fact my friend we are now so positive of our knowledge of the knife's mind that we are prepared to enter into the next phase of our program within a very short while if we are correct we shall with your help arrest the most feared arch criminal that earth has ever known he chuckled but there was little mirth in it <laughs> i dare say that the public will be extremely happy to hear of his death and i know that colonel mannheim and the rest of us will be glad to know that he will never kill again stanton saw that the fateful day was looming suddenly large in the future how soon within days 
He lowered his eyes from the ceiling and looked into Stanton's face with a mildly bland expression. By the way, he said, did you know that your brother is returning to Earth tomorrow? Interlude Is this our young man, Dr. Farnsworth? asked the man in uniform. Yes, it is. Colonel Mannheim, I'd like you to meet Mr. Bartholomew Stanton. How are you, Mr. Stanton? Fine, Colonel. A little nervous. The Colonel chuckled softly. I can't say that I blame you. It's not an easy decision to make. He looked at Dr. Farnsworth. Has Dr. Yoritomo any more information for us? Farnsworth shook his head. No. He admits that his idea is nothing more than a wild hunch. He seems to think that five years of observing the Nipe won't be too much time at all. We may have to act before then. I hope not. It would be a terrible waste, said Mannheim. Mr. Stanton, I know that Dr. Farnsworth has outlined the entire plan to you, and I'm sure you're aware that many things can change in five years. We may have to play by ear long before that. Do you understand what we are doing and why it must be done this way? Yes, sir. You know that you're not to say anything? Yes, sir. Don't worry. I can keep my mouth shut. We're pretty sure of that, the colonel said with a smile. Your psychometric tests showed that we were right in picking you. Otherwise, we couldn't have told you. You understand your part in this, eh? Yes, sir. Any questions? Yes, sir. What about my brother, Martin? I mean, well, I know what's the matter with him, aside from the radiation, I mean. Do you think he'll be able to handle his part of the job after, uh, after the operations? If the operations turn out as well as Dr. Farnsworth thinks they will, yes. And with the therapy we'll give him afterwards, he'll be in fine shape. Well, he looked thoughtful. Five more years. And then I'll have the twin brother that I never really had at all. Somehow it doesn't really register, I guess. Don't worry about it, Mr. Stanton, said Dr. Farnsworth. We've got a complex enough job ahead of us without your worrying in the bargain. By the way, we'll need your signature here. He handed him a pen and spread the paper on the desk. In triplicate. The young man read quickly through the release form. All nice and legal, huh? Well, he hesitated for a moment, then bent over and wrote, Bartholomew Stanton in a firm, clear hand. End of Part 7「Part 8 of Anything You Can Do » by Randall Garrett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 8 The tunnel was long and black, and the air was stale and thick with the stench of rodents. Stanton stood still, trying to probe the luminescent gloom that the goggles he wore brought to his eyes. The tunnel stretched out before him, and on and on. Around him was the smell of viciousness and death. Ahead, it goes on to infinity, Stanton thought, ending at last at zero. Barbell, said a voice near his ear. Barhop here, do you read? It was the barest whisper picked up by the antenna in his shoes from the steel rail that ran along the tunnel. Read you, Barhop. Move out, then. You've got a long stroll to go. Stanton started walking, keeping his feet near the rail in case Barhop wanted to call again. As he walked, he could feel the slight motion of the skin-tight woven elastic suit that he wore rubbing against his skin. And he could hear the scratching patter of the rats. Mostly they stayed away from him, but he could see them hiding in corners and scurrying along the sides of the tunnel. Around him six rat-like remote control robots moved with him, shifting their pattern constantly as they patrolled his moving figure. Far ahead, he knew, other rat robots were stationed, watching and waiting, ready to deactivate the knife's detection devices at just the right moment. Behind him, 
another horde moved forward to turn the devices on again it had taken a long time to learn how to shut off those detectors without giving the alarm to the knife's instruments there were nearly a hundred men in on the operation operating the robot rats or watching the hidden cameras that spied upon the knife nearly a hundred and all of them were safe they were outside the tunnel they were with stanton only in proxy they could not die here in this stinking hole but stanton could there was no help for it stanton had to go in person a full-sized robot proxy would be stronger although not faster unless stanton controlled it than the knipe but the knipe would be able to tell that it was a robot and he would simply destroy it with one of his weapons a remote control robot would never get close enough to the knipe to do any good we do not know dr yoritomo had said whether he would recognize it as a robot or not but his instruments would show the metal easily enough and his eyes might be able to see that it was not covered with human skin the rats are covered with real rat hides they are small and he is used to seeing them around but a human-sized robot ah no never so stanton had to go in in person walking southward along the miles of blackness that led to the nest of the knipe overhead was government city he had walked those streets only the night before and he knew that only a short distance above him was an entirely different world somewhere up there his brother was waiting after having run the gamut of televised interviews dinner at one of the best restaurants and a party afterward a celebrity the greatest detective in the solar system they called him fine stuff that stanton wondered what the asteroids were like maybe that would be the place to go after this job was done maybe they'd have a place in the asteroids for a hopped-up superman or maybe there'd be a place here beneath the streets of government city for a dead superman not if i can help it stanton thought with a grim smile the walking seemed to take forever but somehow stanton didn't mind it he had a lot to think over seeing his brother had been unnerving yesterday but today he felt as though everything had been all right all along his memory still was a long way from being complete and it probably always would be he could still scarcely recall any real memories of a boy named martin stanton but and he smiled at the thought he knew more about him than his brother did at that it didn't matter that martin stanton was gone in effect he had been demolished what little there had been of him and a new structure had been built on the old foundation and yet in another way the new structure was very like what would be developed naturally if the accident so early in life had not occurred stanton skirted a pile of rubble on his right there had been a station here once the street above had caved in and filled in with brick concrete cobblestones and steel scrap and then it had been sealed over when the government city was built a part of one wall was still unbroken though a sign built of tile said 86th street he knew although it wasn't visible in the dim glow he kept walking ignoring the rats that scampered over the rubble bar hop to bar bill said the soft voice near his ear no sign of activity from the knipe so far you haven't triggered any of his alarms bar bell to bar hop stanton whispered what's he doing still sitting motionless thinking i guess or sleeping it's hard to tell let me know if he starts moving around will do poor unsuspecting beastie stanton thought Ten years of hard work, ten years of feeling secure, and within a very short time he's going to get the shock of his life. Or maybe not. There was no way of knowing what kind of shocks the knife had taken in his life, Stanton thought, not even of knowing whether the knife was capable of feeling anything like security. 
It was odd, he thought, that he should feel a kinship toward both the Nipe and his brother in such similar ways. He had never met the Nipe, and his brother was a dim picture in his old memories, but they were both very well known to him, certainly better known to him than he was to them. And yet, seeing his brother's face on the TV screen, hearing him talk, watching the way he moved about, watching the expressions on his face, had been a tremendously moving thing. Not until that moment had he really known himself. Meeting him face to face would be easier now, but it would still be a scene highly charged with emotional tension. He kicked something that rattled and rolled away from him. He stopped, freezing in his tracks, trying to pierce the dully glowing gloom. It was a human skull. He relaxed and began walking again. There were plenty of bones down here. Mannheim had said that the tunnels had been used as air raid shelters when the sun bomb had hit the island during the Holocaust. Thousands had crowded underground after the warning had come, and they had died when the bright, hot, deadly gas had roared down through the ventilators and open stairwells. There were even caches of canned goods down here, some of them still sealed after all this time. But the rats, wiser than they knew, had chewed at them, exposing the steel beneath the tin plate. After a while, oxidation would weaken a can to the point where some lucky rat would bite through it and find himself a meal. Then he could move the empty can aside and gnaw the next one in the pile, and the cycle would begin again. It kept the rats fed almost as well as an automatic machine might have. The tunnel was an endless, monochromatic world that was both artificial and natural. Here there was a neatly squared-off mosaic of ceramic tile. Over there, on a little hillock of earth, squatted a colony of fat mushrooms. In one place he had to skirt a pool of water, in another climb over a heap of rust and debris that had once been a subway car. One man, alone, walking through the dark, towards a superhuman monster that had terrorized Earth for a decade. A drug that would knock out the Nipe would have been useful, but that would have required a greater knowledge of the Nipe's biochemistry than anyone had. The same applied to anesthetic gases or electric shock or supersonics. The only answer was a man called Stanton. And the voice near his ear said, A hundred yards to go, Barbell. I know, he whispered. He hasn't moved? No. Wouldn't it be funny if he were dead, Stanton thought, if his heart had stopped or something? Wouldn't that be a big joke on everybody, especially me? Ahead, the tunnel made a curving turn, and there was a large area that had once been a major junction of two tunnels, one below the other. The Nipe had taken over a part of that area to build his home away from home. Stanton approached the turn and took off the infrared goggles. Enough light spilled over from the Nipe's lair to illuminate the tunnel. He put the goggles on the trackway. He wouldn't need them again. He went on around the curve, slowly and quietly. He didn't want to fight down here in the tracks, and he didn't want to be caught just yet. Cautiously, he lifted himself up to the platform, where long-gone passengers had once waited for long-gone trains. Now that he was out of the trench that the tracks lay in, he could move more easily. He moved away from the tracks. Barbell, he's heard you. Watch it. But Stanton had already heard the movement of the Nipe. He jerked off the communicator and threw it away. He didn't want any encumbrances now. And then, as fast as any express train that had ever moved in these underground ways, the Nipe came around a corner thirty feet away, his four violet eyes gleaming, his limbs rippling beneath his centipede-like body. From fifteen feet away, he launched himself through the air, his outstretched hands ready to kill. 
but Stanton's marvelous neuromuscular system was already in action. At this stage of the game, it would be suicide to let the knife get close. He couldn't fend off eight grasping hands with his own two. He leaped to one side, and the knife got his first surprise in ten years when Stanton's fist slammed against the side of his snouted head, knocking him in the opposite direction from that in which Stanton had moved. The knife landed, turned, and charged back toward the man. This time he reared up, using his two rear pairs of limbs for locomotion, while the two forward pair were held out, ready to kill. He got surprise number two when Stanton's fist landed on his snout, rocking his head back. His own hands meant nothing but air, and by the time he had recovered from the blow, Stanton was well back out of the way. He was so small, Stanton thought wonderingly. Even when he reared up, the knife's head was only three feet above the concrete floor. The knife came in again, more cautiously this time. Stanton punched again with a straight right. The knife moved his head aside, and Stanton's knuckles merely grazed the side of his head below the lower right eye. One of the knife's hands came in in a chopping right hook that took Stanton just below the ribs. Stanton leaped back with a gasp of pain. The knife didn't use fists. He used his open hand, fingers together like a judo fighter. The knife came forward once more, and as Stanton danced back, the knife made a grab for his ankle, almost catching it. There were too many hands to watch. Stanton had two advantages, weight and reach. His arms were almost half again as long as the knife's. Against that, the knife had all those hands, and with his low center of gravity and four-footed stance, it would be hard to knock him down. If Stanton lost his footing, the fight would be over fast. Stanton lunged suddenly forward and planted a left in the knife's right upper eye, then followed it with a right uppercut to the knife's jaw as his head snapped back. The knife's four hands cut inward from the sides like sword blades, but they found no target. Backing away, Stanton suddenly realized that he had another advantage. The knife couldn't throw a straight jab. His shoulder, if that's what they should be called, were narrow, and the upper arm bones weren't articulated properly for such a blow. He could throw a mean hook, but he had to get in close to deliver it. On the other side of the coin was the fact that the knife knew plenty about human anatomy, from the bones out. Stanton's knowledge of knife anatomy was almost totally superficial. He wished he knew if and where the knife had a solar plexus. He would like to punch something soft for a change. Instead, he tried for another eye. He danced in, jabbed, and danced out again. The knife had ducked again, taking it on the side of his head. Then the knife came in low, at an angle, trying for the groin. For his troubles, he got a knee in the jaw that staggered him badly. One grasping hand clutched at Stanton's right thigh and grasped hard. Stanton swung his fist down like a pendulum and knocked the arm aside. But there was a slight limp in his movement as he backpedaled away from the knife. That full-handed pinch had hurt. Stanton was angry now, with the hot, controlled anger of a fighting man. He stepped in and slammed two fast, hard jabs into the point of the knife's snout, jarring the monster backwards. This time, it was the knife who scuttled backwards. Stanton moved in to press his advantage and landed a butte on the knife's lower left eye. Then he tried a body blow. It wasn't too successful. The alien had an endoskeleton, but he also had a hide that was like somewhat leathery chitin. He pulled back, out of the way of the knife's judo cuts. His fists were beginning to hurt, and his leg was paining him badly where the knife had clamped onto it, and his ribs. And then he realized that, so far, the knife had only landed one blow. One punch and one pinch, he thought with a touch of awe. The only other damage he'd inflicted has been to my knuckles. 
the knight charged in again then he leaped suddenly and clawed for stanton's face with his first pair of hands the second and third pairs chopped in toward the man's body the last pair propelled him off the floor stanton stepped back and let him have a right just below the jaw where his throat would have been if he'd been human the knife arced backwards in a half somersault and landed flat on his back stanton backed up a little more waiting while the knife wriggled feebly for a moment the marquis of queensberry should have lived to see this he thought the knife rolled over and crouched on all eight limbs his violet eyes watched stanton but the man could read no expression on that inhuman face. You do not kill. For a moment Stanton found it hard to believe that the hissing, guttural voice had come from the crouching monster. You do not even try to kill. I have no wish to kill you, Stanton said evenly. I can see that. Do you are you he stopped as if baffled there are not the proper words do you follow the customs stanton felt a surge of triumph this was what george yoritomo had guessed might happen if i must kill you he said carefully i myself will do the honors you will not go uneaten the knife sagged a little, relaxing all over. I had hoped it was so. It was the only thinkable thing. I saw you on the television, and it was only thinkable that you came for me. Stanton blinked, stunned. What was the knife thinking? But of course he knew, and he saw that even his brother's return had been a part of the plan i knew you were out in the asteroids the knife went on but i had decided you had come to kill since you did not what are your thoughts stanley martin that we should help each other stanton said it was as simple as that Stanton sat in his hotel room, smoking a cigarette, staring at the wall, and thinking. He was alone again. All the fuss, feathers, and foo were over. Farnsworth was in another room of the suite, making his plans for a complete physical examination of the knife. Yoritomo was having the time of his life, holding a conversation with the knife, drawing the alien out, and getting him to talk about his own race and their history and Mannheim was plotting the next phase of the capture, the cover-up. Stanton smiled a little. Colonel Mannheim was a great one for planning, all right. Every little detail was taken care of. It sometimes made his plans more complex than necessary, Stanton suspected. Mannheim tended to try to account for every eventuality, and after he had done that, he would set aside reserves here and there just in case they might be useful if something unforeseen happened. Stanton got up, walked over to the window, and looked down at the streets of Government City, eight floors below. All things considered, the government had done the right thing. And in picking Mannheim, they had picked the right man. What would the average citizen think if he knew the true story of the Nipe? if he discovered that at this very moment the knife was being treated almost as an honored guest of the government if he suspected that the knife could have been killed easily at any time during the past six years would it be possible to explain that in the long run the knowledge possessed by the knife was tremendously more valuable to the race of man than the lives of a few individuals could those people down there and the others like them all over the world be made to understand that by his own lights the knife had been acting in the most civilized and gentlemanly way he knew would they see that because of the priceless information stored in that alien brain the knife's life had to be preserved at all cost 
Dr. Yuritomo assumed that Mannheim would spread a story about the knife's death, perhaps even display a carefully made corpse, but Stanton had the feeling that the colonel had something else up his sleeve. The phone rang. Stanton walked over, thumbed the answer stud, and watched Dr. Farnsworth's face take shape on the screen. Bart, I just saw the tapes of your fight with the knife. Incredible! I'm going to have to run them over again, slow down, so that I can see what went on. And I'd like to have you tell me as best you can what went on in your mind at each stage of the fight. You mean right now? I have an appointment. Farnsworth waved a hand. No, no, later. Take your time. But I am honestly amazed that you won so easily. I knew you were good, and I knew you'd win, but I honestly expected you to be injured. Stanton looked down at his bandaged hands and felt the ache of his broken rib and the blue bruise on his thigh. In spite of the way it looked, he had actually been hurt worse than the knife had. That boy was tough. The trouble was that he couldn't adapt himself to fighting in a new way, he told Farnsworth. He fought me as he would have fought another knife, and that didn't work. I had the reach on him, and I could maneuver faster. It looked to me as though you were fighting him as you would fight another human being, Farnsworth said. Stanton grinned. I was in a modified way, but I won. The knife didn't. Farnsworth grinned back. I see. Well, I'll let you know when I'm ready for your impressions. Probably tomorrow sometime. Fine. He walked back over to the window, but this time he looked at the horizon, not at the street. Farnsworth had called him Bart. It's funny, Stanton thought, how habit can get the best of a man. Farnsworth had known the truth all along, and now he knew that his patient, former patient, was aware of the truth, and still he had called him Bart. And I still think of myself as Bart, he thought. I probably always will. And why not? Martin Stanton no longer existed. In fact, he had never had much of a real existence. He was only a bad dream. Only Bart was real. Take two people genetically identical. Damage one of them so badly that he is helpless and useless and always only a step away from death. It is inevitable that the weaker will identify himself with the stronger. The vague telepathic bond that always links identical twins, they think alike, they say, becomes unbalanced under such conditions. Normally there is a give and take, and each preserves the sense of his own identity, since the two different sets of sense receptors give different viewpoints. But if one of the twins is damaged badly enough, something must happen to the telepathic link. Usually it is broken. But the link between Mort and Bart Stanton had not been broken. It had become a one-way channel. Martin, in order to escape the prison of his own body, had become a receptor for Bart's thoughts. He felt as Bart felt. The thrill of running after a baseball, the pride of doing something clever with his hands. In effect, Martin ceased to think. The thoughts in his mind were Bart's. The feeling of identity was almost complete. To an outside observer, it appeared that Martin had become a cataleptic schizophrenic, completely cut off from reality. The Bart part of him did not want to be disturbed by the sensory impressions that Mart's body provided. Like the schizophrenic, Martin was living in a little world that was cut off from the actual physical world around his body. The difference between Martin's condition and that of the ordinary schizophrenic was that his little world actually existed. It was an almost exact counterpart of the world that existed in the perfectly sane, rational mind of his brother Bart. It grew and developed as Bart did, fed by the telepathic flow from the stronger mind to the weaker. There were two Barts, 
and no mart at all and then the neurophysical institute had come into the picture a new process had been developed by which a human being could be reconstructed made literally into a superman the drawback was that a normal human body resisted the process to the death if necessary just as a normal human body will resist a skin graft from an alien donor but the radiation damaged body of martin stanton had no resistance of that kind with him perhaps the process might work so bartholomew stanton martin's legal guardian after the death of their mother had given permission for the series of operations that would rebuild his brother the telepathic link of course had to be shut off for a time at least part of that could be done in the treatment of martin but bart too had to do his part by submitting to hypnosis he had allowed himself to be convinced that his name was stanley martin he had taken a job on luna and then gone to the asteroids the simple change of name and environment had been just enough to snap the link during a time when martin's brain had been inactivated by therapy and anesthetics only the sense of identity remained the patient was still bart mannheim had used them both naturally colonel mannheim had the ability to use anyone at hand including himself to get a job done stanton looked at his watch it was almost time Mannheim had sent for Stanley Martin when the time had come for him to return in order to give the knife data that he would be sure to misinterpret. A special code phrase in the message had released Stanley Martin from the post-hypnotic suggestion that had held him for so long. He knew that he was Bartholomew Stanton again. And so do I, thought the man by the window. We have a lot to straighten out, we two there was a knock at the door stanton walked over and opened it trying to think it was like looking into a mirror hello bart he said hello bart said the other in that instant the complete telepathic linkage was restored and they both knew what only one of them had known before that for a time the flow had been one way again that stanley martin had experienced the entire battle with the knife. His release from the post-hypnotic suggestion had made it possible. E duibus unum. There was unity without loss of identity. End of Anything You Can Do by Randall Garrett